morning. It's good to see you all for this annual event of Louisiana College. I think it's important for us annually to be reminded of our founding, reminded of our purpose, reminded of why God planted a school here in 1906 that continues today to prepare graduates, to transform lives, a place where all truth is God's truth, a place where we focus on the maturity of intellect, coupled, reinforced, strengthened by the maturity of Christian character. So thankful that you're here today. Those that are, we have some special guests with us today. I know Reverend Foster has friends and family that are here today. We welcome you. We're grateful you're with us today. We also know that we have those with us today who have been recipients of the Distinguished Service Award in the past, and we thank you for joining us as well. There are trustees here. There are other friends and donors and family, and thank you for joining us this day. Would you join me in prayer? This is the day you've made, Lord, and we rejoice, and we're glad in it. We're grateful. We recognize today, Lord, that we stand upon the firm foundation of Jesus Christ. But there is no greater foundation than that's been established, the cornerstone of the church. The one who has paid the penalty for our sin. The one who is pleading our case before the Father even today. The one whose blood was shed to save, to redeem, to heal, to transform. The one who still has power to save. We stand upon that name above all other names. And so thankful, Lord, that you led men and women well over 100 years ago to plant a college here that would be a light that would send out students to go into every culture-shaping venue who've earned the right to be heard, who've earned the right to tell people what compels them, and it's the love of Jesus Christ. And so we say thank you. We know that we stand upon today the shoulders of men and women who've preceded us, who have paved the way, who have sacrificed, who have given much. And Lord, may we never forget that. As young college students in this room today, may we be mindful of that, of those who've come before us. As that song says, may those who come after us find us faithful. That indeed is our prayer today. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. Dr. French is coming now to bestow the uh, honor of this day. Dr. French and Reverend Foster. Let's give them a warm welcome this morning. Thank you. We come today to honor James Lewis Foster. After graduating from Buckeye High School in 1964, he began his long-time relationship with Louisiana College. He came to Louisiana College on an academic scholar, on an athletic scholarship and received his Bachelor of Science and Degree in Education in 1969 and began teaching in the Louisiana public school systems. He graduated from Mississippi College with a master's degree in school administration in 1973 and returned to Rapids Parish to continue his teaching and coaching career at Buckeye High School. He also completed a Louisiana vocational techni technical program to become a certified and licensed barber and also his plus 30 hours. After 24 years, he retired from the Rapids Parish school system. He received the call to preach in 1966 while attending Louisiana College. He pastored in Pineville from 1970 to 1973, and then he began an evangelistic singing and preaching uh, career throughout the southern United States. 
He was minister of music at Temple Baptist Church in Gina from 1989 to 1996, continuing his teaching and coaching career, and the Utility Baptist Church in Jonesville called Reverend Foster to be their pastor in 1996, and he served there for the last 19 years. Reverend Foster has been married to his childhood sweetheart, Wanda Hudson Foster, since 1967. And this year, they celebrated 49 years of blissful marriage. They have three children and three wonderful grandchildren. Amen. All right. Over the years, Reverend Foster has nurtured his relationship with Louisiana College in academia, spiritual conferences, and sports. He counts many of his former students as graduates of Louisiana College, as well as his two brothers, his sister jo Joan, and two of his children. He is thankful for the sacrifices made by his parents who prioritized his Christian education. Now in recognition and appreciation for his love and support of Louisiana College, for his professional contributions to business and in the teaching profession, the Louisiana College Board of Trustees proudly confers to James Lewis Foster the Trustees Distinguished Service Award on this day, October 15, 2015. Congratulations. It's hard for a preacher to say that I'm speechless. But I do have two uh, words I'd like to give you before I start. Well, glory! <laughs> Amen. With a heart that is so thankful for our godly parents, a godly mother, Every day, 3.30, Mama would set me on her knee and tell me a Bible story. Godly Sunday school teachers, wonderful pastors, a good church, and then the privilege to come to an outstanding college. What a joy it was to be able to be a, a student here at Louisiana College. I don't live but 20 miles down the road. And I'll never forget the Sunday that I left to come to the college, I had to get in a couple of weeks early because we were starting two-a-day football practice. Didn't have a suitcase. We were just country folks. Never went on many vacations. Had an old green army uh, case that my uncle used in World War II. Packed all my clothes in that. Went back to Grandma's. I said, Grandma, I'm leaving home. And Grandma cried. Went to my other grandparents, I'm leaving home. My grandma cried there. I said, well, grandma, I'm just going 20 miles down the road. This college is a marvelous place. No place in the world like Louisiana College. I just want to mention one professor, and I'll do like Liz Taylor told her fifth husband, I won't keep you long. <laughs> no, they don't know who Liz Taylor is, do they? <laughs> My first class at Louisiana College was under Dr. Whittington. He taught Bible, and I was just a country boy, just green, had no idea what to expect out of a college class. And that day, Dr. Whittington walked into the class with a gray suit on. His hair was white. He had on silver-rimmed glasses. And he, he turned and faced the class. 
and looked at about 25 students, freshmen. The class was entitled The Harmony of the Gospels. And Dr. Whit stood there for just a minute and tears began to flow down his cheeks. I want you to know that touched his country boy's heart. I knew I was in the right place because you see, I was raised in that kind of atmosphere. The churches I went to were not afraid to raise their hand. They were not afraid to stand and praise the Lord. In fact, as a little baby, mama would put me on a pallet and on Sunday nights, I would be awakened to the shouts of saints in that little church. So I've always found it altogether fitting and proper to worship God. For some reason or another, we're afraid of it. We shouldn't ever be afraid. We ought to be proud that we can lift our hands and say, well, glory, thank you, Father. So I came into this school and I met a professor that was on the same level that I was. He sat there and wept. I took as many classes as I could under Dr. Wheat while I was here. Had the wonderful privilege to serve with him in his church, to lead the music for him and, and then preach for him on Sunday nights. And you know, we would ride home together and Dr. Whit would critique my sermons. You talk about hands-on stuff. Man, he ripped my sermons apart. I'd say, Doc, you don't have to say any more. I got, I got the point. He said, James, but you have one great problem. He said, you just murdered the king's English. When the Lord saved me, he changed my life. And when he saves you, he changes your life. And you know what? You change from a, a sinner, a lost man on the way to hell. You change to a person that's a child of God. You have all your blood flowing through your veins. You count. You're somebody in the eyes of the Lord. And your life goes to serving others. I'm reminded of the story of Dr. Booth. He was the founder of the Salvation Army. And he was on his way to the national convention to be the keynote speaker and something happened and he wasn't able to make the, his, his connections in the plane and he got, uh, he, he got left out and he wasn't able to get there. He got on the, on the telegraph machine, sent an off a word to the man that was in charge of that meeting and he said, this is what I want you to tell the people. He gave him one word. That word was others. The Word of God says that you are bought with a price. You're no longer your own. You belong to Him. And when you belong to Him, friend, you're going to serve Him through serving others. Some years ago, I heard this little chorus, and I want to sing it to you. It's really the, it's really the, uh, the, the story of the Good Samaritan. It says this, on the darkest side of the road where the sick and the wounded lie they're calling for help and for mercy oh how can you pass them by the savior ask your help in the service of want and pain and anything more that thou spendest he'll pay when he comes again friend there's a payday coming for the saints of god I appreciate the faculty here. I appreciate our new president here. A, a man that I just know with all of my heart is going to bring this school to greater heights. A wonderful Christian man dedicated to the service of the Lord. And most of all, Board of Trustees in Louisiana College, 
I'm still scratching my head wondering how did I get this award. But it is such an honor, and I'll receive it in the same spirit that you've given it. Thank you so much, and God bless you. Amen. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Now those guys on the football team, you heard Brother James, you, you linemen, you see what you grow up and become. You know, you got to become a preacher, a teacher, a barber, and a singer. And then some. All right. 
Thank you, brother. What a day we've had, and we're so blessed to have one of my friends. And there's been a few people in my life I've been fortunate enough to speak into my life and mentor me. And something that I want to say to my college students, find those people and let them speak into your life. Let them lead. They've been there. They've done the tough stuff. Learn from them. And our guest speaker is one of those in my life. He's a statesman of Southern Baptist life. You see on the back of your program all the wonderful things spoken of Dr. Carlisle Driggers. He served for well over 20 years as the executive director and treasurer of South Carolina Baptist Convention, where I was privileged to serve for 28 years at a university before joining you all just a few months ago. During that time, I watched and observed a great leader, a great Christian leader, a transformational leader. God gave him I think one of the most brilliant ideas in the last 25 years of Southern Baptist life of empowering kingdom growth. that got our minds and our hearts around planting churches, building people, moving forward for the kingdom, and coming together as a people for the gospel. And he laid it on this man's heart. It went from South Carolina, then it went to become embraced by the entire Southern Baptist Convention. He's humble. He's gifted. We're so glad Jeanette could be with us today. Where are you, Ms. Driggers? Oh, we thank you for being with us. And as I said earlier, as you just get more beautiful and Carlisle just gets, anyway, like all rest of us old guys, you know. But join me. He's a statesman. He's my friend. He's an author. He's a thinker. And you're going to come to see the, here this morning a dynamic communicator. Welcome, Dr. Carlisle Driggers. Dr. Brewer, trustees, faculty, other distinguished guests who are here, uh, the honor bestowed was wonderful, and I'm so grateful that I could be here and be a part of that um, uh, award um, uh, to, um, Dr. to Pastor Foster. And students, of course, when your president uh, called me some months ago about being here and being back at um, Louisiana College, where I had been once before back in the spring to meet with the trustees. I think I surprised him at how quick I said, I'd love to do that. I'd love to come back. When I was here before and uh, drove around the campus and walked around some in the brief time that I was here, I was so very, very impressed with this campus, the beautiful, beautiful buildings and the grounds, and uh, then began to study the history of Louisiana Baptist College and even more impressed about that. So I am certainly honored and humbled to be here today and to meet with you and uh, be, um, be uh, featured with you on this uh, Founders Day. How marvelous, thank you for the invitation. Um, uh, when you read the Bible, there are phrases that jump out at us, of course, all of us who study scripture. But some time ago from the minor prophet Habakkuk, I was reading uh, that little book, almost unknown, very few people refer to Habakkuk when we do our devotional reading or we preach or teach or whatever it is. But there's a phrase in the King James Version of the, of the Old Testament and again in the New King James Version. There's a phrase that just jumped out at me and it's been a part of my life now for many years. Uh, in uh, Habakkuk chapter three, verse six, the prophet is talking about the work of God, how he went about doing what he did. And in verse six, it reads, as God made the earth, he measured himself. He measured the earth. What does that mean? God measured his steps. He saw to it that what he did was exactly what he wanted to be done. Sometimes I'm surprised about that. I, I, God's got a sense of humor. I mean, how, how, could he, how, how could he invite a tiny little flea and a huge elephant? I don't understand that. Um, but that God measured his steps. God knew what he was doing when he created the earth. And uh, as I've thought about being with you here today, that phrase has come back to my mind and heart over and over again. Louisiana Baptist College, measuring your steps, has been all these years and continues to be and will be on into the future. For a good many years in my life and journey of faith, back uh, when I was a much younger fellow, 
I was invited to join the staff of what we call then the Baptist Home Mission Board in Atlanta, Georgia, now today North American Mission Board, same organization, different name. But back when I was asked as a very young fellow, hadn't been graduated from seminary too long, and was a pastor of a church in Louisville, Kentucky, an interracial changing community, and folks began to know that our church was reaching out to all races. This was back in the mid-1960s. It didn't make any difference, black, white, young, old. We just tried to reach folks. Many other churches were moving and leaving the city, but we stayed there and went to work, and I was so young doing that. Um, hadn't done that for too many years until the Home Mission Board invited me to join their staff and to come and work in the Department of Black Church Relations, as we called it back in those years. Don't even have that now. But Black Church Relations. What that meant was that I was given the opportunity uh, to go around the country and to worship with Black Baptists, especially, in all kinds of settings, sometimes uh, in great convention meetings, sometimes in small workshops, sometimes preaching in black uh, uh, churches, uh, Baptist churches, African-American churches, other times being one-on-one -on -one with uh, folks that I grew to know as very, very dear friends and continue to be to this good day. But uh, I would go to be invited to speak in one of our African-American Baptist churches. It might have been in the state of Washington or in Boston or in Florida, wherever it was, and I would accept those invitations with great joy and a little bit of nervousness uh, because this white boy from South Carolina, I mean, that was a new experience for me, but I absolutely loved it. And I would go to those churches to preach on Sundays and discovered that many times in the churches before the formal church started and the pastor would come to preach so magnificently, they would have those uh, prayer services led many times by the deacons. And they would have a 30, 45 minute a time of prayer uh, in the auditorium, in the sanctuary. And the deacons would lead that. Uh, they would sing some, they would pray a lot. They'd testify a little bit. But I began to hear a phrase I don't care what the country, part of the country it was in, I began to hear a phrase that uh, these deacons would use. They would pray about their church and about members of the church. And they would pray, Lord, teach us to measure our steps. Teach us to measure our steps. I'm convinced that they found that in the back of chapter 3, verse 6, where we read that God measured the earth. God measured his steps. He knew exactly what he was doing. And I discovered uh, in hearing that phrase over and over and over again that they were praying, God help us as a church to be sure that we're representing Jesus Christ correctly. Help us to measure our steps as we reach out to other folks and as we seek to care for them. And that phrase has stuck with me through the years. A call to measure our steps. And Louisiana Cottage, wonderful past, present now, future ahead. Measure your steps. Measure your steps as you move on into the future. I have uh, appreciated learning about Louisiana Baptist College, about your past and about your present, thinking about that and projecting into the future. For a fact, history is a pact between the dead and the living and the yet unborn. And when we have a Founders Day exercise, like today, it's a time to remember the past and talk about the present and move on into the future. Um, I've, I've enjoyed studying about your history. In the late 1800s, a group of Baptists in Louisiana from some of the churches began to meet together and to say, we need a cottage for higher learning purposes. We need a cottage to train our young people. And in those late 1800s, a decision was made by the Louisiana Baptist Convention to give birth to a cottage. And indeed, that took place in 1904 uh, when Pineville was, was selected as a location for the new cottage. And the cottage opened its doors on October 3, 1906, and uh, began with 19 male students and three faculty members. Then in 1906, that the decision was made to name this institution the Louisiana Baptist College, continues to this day. In 1907, they established the first football team and had 14 players. Now, somebody got beat up on pretty good with just 14 players, offense and defense, they had to play. In 1908, the first president 
of Louisiana College was named E.O. Ware. I find that to be interesting, Mr. President. They had a football team, quote, ahead of president. I think they, they got the priorities in order somewhere along the way. And then in 1909, Louisiana College became co-educational. But the girls had to stay at home. They weren't about to have those girls on the campus living here. Huh. So they had them at home. But they did become co-educational. Uh, that history is absolutely priceless. And I've enjoyed reading and studying about it. And then through the years here in this good place, buildings have been built, faculty and staff have been added, raised monies, uh, added playing fields and water sports, and a number of other activities uh, along the way. All kinds of, of paved streets and planting trees and shrubbery and on and on and on. Across the years when you read your history, some of the buildings have burned that were built earlier. There have been uh, faculty members coming and going, many, many students through this good place. Budget shortfalls, curriculum changes, graduation exercises, and heartaches and tears and joy and gladness, sacks reviews, <laughs> and uh, all kinds of orientations, on and on and on. The history of Louisiana Baptist College. It's fascinating to read it and to study it, and I'm glad I had the opportunity to do so. As I have read it and thought and prayed about it and for today, Somewhere along the way, always measuring your steps. There have been somebody who have said, if we're going to move far into the future, then we've got to measure our steps. We've got to make wise and good decisions in keeping with the Spirit of God. When he made this good earth that we live on, he measured his steps. He knew what he was doing. He did it right, and he entrusted it to mankind. Um, measuring your steps. Uh, doting on the financial support and strength and blessings of the churches of the Louisiana, Louisiana Baptist Convention. Um, along the way, this good school has graduates who have now medical degrees, missionaries, scientists, teachers, pastors, coaches, business leaders, governmental officials, bankers, nurses, media personnel, technologists, and on and on and on and some very, very distinguished graduates of Louisiana College I've discovered. One of those, B.B. McKinney. B.B. McKinney went to school here. Some of you don't know who B.B. McKinney was, but there's not a more treasured name in the musical world of Southern Baptist than B.B. McKinney. That good man, born in Louisiana, studied here, composed some 600 gospel hymns, and edited 24 songbooks and hymnals. He taught for 14 years at the Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Texas, and then for many years he directed the Sunday School Board that used to be called Music Department in Nashville, Tennessee. And how many revivals that good man sang in and led, who knows? B.B. McKinney, a distinguished former student at Louisiana Baptist College, among many others. Another, another graduate of this good place, Governor Jimmy Davis, graduated in 1924. When my dad, I grew up out in the country in South Carolina, I can remember and always will, I have a little baby, had a baby sister um, who was a little younger than I, um, just bouncy little girl, always full of, full of life and vim and vigor. She still is, never met a stranger, head full of curly hair. And uh, he'd be out in the yard working around his shop, whatever it was, and my little sister Linda would come out and she'd see her daddy and she'd go running up to him and he'd pick her up and he'd start singing Jimmy Davis' song. And many of you know that song to be true. You are my sunshine. Who knows that song? My only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. You'll never know, dear, how much I love you. Please don't take my sunshine away. That was Jimmy Davis. And that song was sung and has been all of these years by one of your graduates. I have read, asked questions, listened, pondered for today's uh, exercise, prayed for this time together, and in doing so, have prayed about Louisiana College, not only about your past, being grateful, and the present, but thinking about the future. As you move forward into the future, measure your steps. Do it thoughtfully. Do it with expertise. Do it with care. I would offer, Dr. Brewer, to you and to other leaders of this institution, five, five critical steps to take 
as you move forward into the future. The first one is, of course, let the Bible be your primary source book at Louisiana College. Not just portions of the Bible, but all of the Bible. Let it be your source book, your plan book, the one to refer to, whether you're teaching biology or business or religion or whatever it is, look to the Bible as the very word of God and learn from it and put it to good use day after day. Measure your steps. Someone who certainly measured his steps is one of our American heroes, George Washington Carver. Born in Missouri to a black mother who was a slave. And when he was just a little baby, we're told that night raiders came into the Carver farm, a plantation, whatever it was, in Missouri back in those years. And they stole her and along the way picked up a little baby with her. These night raiders would come into the plantations and farms and they would discover the slaves who were there and they would steal them away in the, way up in the nighttime when everybody was asleep. They'd steal them away and take them off somewhere to put them to work on their plantations or to sell them for profit. And they stole this mother and her little baby boy named George. Along the way the next morning, Mr. Carver, the plantation owner, learned what had happened, got his men together, took off on their horses to go find out where she might be and to bring her home with the baby. Never found her. She was gone forever as far as knowing where she might have wound up. But they did find the little baby, little baby George, and abandoned him by the side of the trail. They picked the baby up, brought him back. And Mr. and Mrs. Carver said, we're going to adopt George. He's going to be our baby. We're going to grow him up. We're going to take care of him in remembrance of his mother and to do what is only right. That was in 1864 when he was, when he was born. And then that happened a few months later. Well, in his lifetime, Mr. and Mrs. Carver sent young George. They realized that he was a brilliant young boy. They sent him to the Iowa State College to study botany, where he did graduated, and then went to Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, where he taught for 47 years. George Washington Carver measured his steps. He literally changed agriculture in the Southland of this country. It was mainly cotton and tobacco. But George Washington Carver, in his laboratory at Tuskegee Institute, began to discover other uses for vegetables and for crops and changed farming in the Southland of this nation. And especially did he study the peanut, and that's what he is most known for. He created over 300 products from that little tiny peanut, cosmetics, ink, shaving creams, wood stains, paints, dyes, soap, instant coffee, and on and on and on. In 1921, the Congress of our nation invited George Washington Carver to come and be recognized. He went to the House of Representatives, and as he was being introduced, the Speaker of the House said to him, Professor Carver, how do you do this? How do you know what to do? How have you created so much out of almost nothing, a little tiny peanut and everything else you've done and put it into all kind of products that are being used across our land today to bless our people? Where'd you get your information? And George Washington Carver said, Mr. Speaker, from an ancient book. An ancient book? What book? The Bible, Mr. Speaker. He said, the Bible says that God, almighty God, created the world. And I believe that with all of my life. And what I've tried to do is to get in step with God. I've tried to learn what God wanted to happen with what he had created. And to do everything that I can to make this world a better place for all humanity. Well, he was recognized by the House of Representatives in 1921. And then in 1943, when he died, the Congress of the United States um, recognized him for his greatness to America, measuring his steps, and created the day of January 5 uh, as a George Washington Carver Day 
in American life. How marvelous. All from an ancient book. Louisiana Baptist College, measure your steps in all that you do, but by all means use the Bible as your guide, as your textbook. Then secondly, let Jesus, you would expect me to say this, but I'm going to say it anyhow, let Jesus be your guide as you go and your Savior. Back in 1965, when I was just getting started in being a pastor of a church in Louisville, Kentucky, back in 1965, I had an opportunity to go for the first time ever to the Baptist World Alliance meeting in Miami, Florida. Baptist World Alliance are Baptists from all over the world who come together every five years at some place. It's coming up soon in South Africa. Uh, but uh, the, the Baptists just come, and that was my first time to be there. And we were meeting in the Orange Bowl in Miami. And uh, I will never forget, I'd never been in anything like that. I'm a country boy. I grew up not around situations like that. And I looked around in that Orange Bowl arena as we were singing, and the theme song, the hymn that was used over and over and over and over again was all, Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Yes, amen. And I would look around as we were singing, and I was standing there with everybody else from around the world. Never seen anything like that. All the different colors that people were dressed in, the different apparel, the different headpieces, all kinds of languages. They'd say, now sing this hymn in your own language. And I would stop singing and just listen to all the languages that were being sung together in that great place down in Miami. All hail the power of Jesus' name. And I got chill bumps and I got tears. Jesus is the Savior of the world. Jesus is your Savior and my Savior. There's no Savior but Jesus. And at Louisiana Baptist College, measure your steps according to Scripture and according to the example of Jesus Christ, who gave his all that we might have life and life everlasting. Number three, know that your school exists for the students. This school is not here for the trustees. This school is not here for the administration. This school is not here or anybody more importantly than the students. And what you do together here is to enable these students to develop their talents and learn to measure their steps through life and not waste their lives, but use their lives to the glory of God through Christ. That's your task, that's your work. Measure your steps, focus on the students. And I would say to the faculty and administration, those who tend to the grounds, whatever you do, wash dishes, serve food, whatever you do around here, do it as an act of worship unto God for those students as you go from day to day. Number four, keep the faith of the churches. Let them be proud of you as an institution. When the churches, the Baptist churches of this state, believe in this school as obviously they have and need to be even more for the future in these troubling, changing times that we're living in. Who knows a few years from now what's going to happen? But during these times and the times ahead, measure your steps. Be faithful for the churches. Keep them being proud of you as an institution. Work at it. And then number five, be wise recipients of the monies provided for Louisiana College from the churches through the Louisiana Baptist Convention. I don't know about this, but I'm quite sure I'm correct. The biggest donor to this institution year after year after year is the Louisiana Baptist Convention. Others may donate $2 million, $3 million, $10 million, whatever it is, one-time gifts that come, but year after year after year after year, the Louisiana Baptist Convention is faithful to pass on from the churches funds of the cooperative program to enable this school to measure your steps as you move on into the future. Be grateful for those funds. Don't take them for granted. Use them and use them wisely. Well, God has brought together at this college so very many capable leaders. And I want to say something about your new president. I've known Dr. Brewer, I'm trying to think about that, I think since about 1990, 91, somewhere along in there, when he was a very young man in South Carolina 
at Charleston Southern University. And in those years, I don't know, he, he may have been carrying the water bucket for the football team. I don't know. He just did it all. I watched him. He loves students. He loves colleges. He loves Baptist colleges. They are his life and have been all. I remember when he went to University of South Carolina and got his PhD degree in educational leadership so he could prepare himself someday. And I knew it was just a matter of time. Just a matter of time before he'd be having an opportunity to be a college president somewhere. I just knew that. Didn't, I hated to lose him in South Carolina at Charleston Southern. He was such a vital part of that institution. It had been all of his adult life. But yet it was a matter of time. And I, I, I'm, I'm very much aware that there were other colleges, three I know of, who approached Dr. Brewer about being their president and talked and interviewed. I am absolutely convinced of it that God was saving Rick Brewer to be your president during these years and the years to come. And uh, I treasure his being here. And I would say to you, with Dr. Brewer, measure your steps as you move forward into the future. And I will predict, in spite of ups and downs and heavals and decisions to be made, trying times, your best years are not in your past. Your best years are hopefully, prayerfully, in your future. Louisiana Baptist College, your future is bright and so very, very promising. Measure it just right and take the necessary steps to honor God every step of the way and receive his blessings upon you as you move forward. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, seek you first the kingdom of God. Seek you first the kingdom of God. If you let that be your goal in all you do, measuring your steps, God will abundantly bless this place because you're doing it in keeping with his will for you. I mentioned a few moments ago that one of the joys of my life was speaking in black Baptist churches, participating in some of the dearest friends I've got in the world are African-American Baptist fellows and women. Love them, treasure them, do anything for me, I do anything for them. And I thank God that I've got them all over the country. Always will learn so very, very much. Um, I, I especially enjoy just going to worship services in many, many of our African-American churches, Baptist churches, and just soaking it up. And I've heard time and time and time again in those worship services especially with the elderly folks, men and women. I've heard them give testimonies, and then I've heard them sing a little gospel song. We've come this far by faith. We've come this far by faith. And I watched those black mamas and those black daddies and grandparents with tears running down their cheeks just singing with joy, we've come thus far by faith. Money is important, buildings are everything, but faith, faith in Jesus that he's going to be with you and help you to measure your steps as you move forward. Nothing is more important than living by faith and being about the work of the kingdom on this earth. Some time ago, I heard a story that just tickled me good. These two deacons, on a beautiful spring Saturday afternoon. In their community, the community, the church was located in the inner city, a lot of houses around. These two men said, well, on this day, we're gonna go out and visit folks. We've got people living in these houses all around us, we don't know them. And so we're just gonna go out and knock on some doors and see who we can invite to know Jesus or invite them to our church or somehow find if they have needs that we can meet as a church. And so these two good men devoted to Jesus Love their church. They just went out from door to door to door, speaking to folks. And they came up on one porch in the house and uh, started to knock on the door. They realized there was a screen door there. It was a warm, nice day, but the wooden door was, was open. And so they could kind of look in, didn't see anybody. And so they knocked on the door. And immediately, these two Doberman dogs, big old dogs, pounced to the door. And uh, growling low, Eyes, eyes just um, glaring at them, tails not wagging. And one man turned to the other and said, I ain't going in there. He said, I'll tell you, I am not going in there. 
And the other man said, I don't think I will either. And then they heard somebody say, come in, come in. They stood there a minute. Did we hear something? Said, it sounded like an old lady. Come in, come in. One man said to the other one, well, now, should we do this or not? I mean, those dogs are glaring at us. And the other one said, well, let's try it. Let's just, let's just open the door and see what will happen. They opened the door. The dogs didn't lunge at them, but they still were looking at them real, real mean-like. Come in, come in. They said, who is pleased? So they started walking down a little hall. They got back to where it was the kitchen. One said, well, we come to the kitchen. Come in, come in. They looked up, and there was a parrot, a parrot in a cage. Come in, come in. One man said to the parrot, well, old parrot, can't you say anything else but come in, come in? He cocked his head and said, sick him, sick him. <laughs> Dr. Brewer, faculty administration, students, the future is ahead of you. Sick him, sick him to the glory of God. God bless you. As you would you please stand and join in singing the alma mater? What a great program, amen? amen? In my church, I have some young police officers that are in the academy faculty, and every Sunday they come to, to get me to sign their bulletin. If I sign their bulletin, they get extra points. I think that might be a good thing for all of our students that are in chapel, because they're going to learn something. Great job, Dr. Driggers. Sick them, sick them. Father, we love you, we worship you, we thank you for what we behold today, students, students that will change the world. Their opportunities are great. The fields are wide unto harvest. Thank you for the faculty that is here today because they love you. They love academia. 
They love, they love the opportunity to empower and to impact these students. Bless everything that's going on at this college. Meet every need that's before us. Raise these students up to be great warriors for the cause of Christ. Thank you for a country boy what a duffel bag that comes 20 miles for his life to be changed and to make a great impact on the institution where he poured his life into and these, this faculty in this school poured its life into him. That's what it's all about, coming back to where you found your strength and the education to do the job that you've been doing all of these years. We love you. We thank you for our president. We know he works too many hours. We ask you to undergird him, give him great grace and rest as needed. For we pray it in Jesus' name.